So hi, everyone. Um, welcome to our Condensed Matter Seminar. Um, we're very happy to have um, with us today um, Ben Franzen from uh, Brigham Young University. Um, ben got his PhD um, in, at Columbia University with uh, Tomo Yumera and Simon Billinge. Um, then he moved on to a, a postdoc um, at Berkeley with Bob Bergino. Um, and then from there um, to assistant professor position at Brigham Young. Um, ben is really uh, an expert in um, probes of magnetic materials that are sensitive to um, nanoscale um, correlations and inhomogeneities, um, namely um, total scattering or pair distribution function measurements and USR um, type measurements. Um, in, in particular, he, he's really pioneered this work um, using um, total neutron scattering measurements, measurements to measure um, short range magnetic correlations in, in real space. He also has some really nice work um, that gives some microscopic insights into the pneumatic orders that show up in um, iron-based superconductors. Um, so I think he's gonna talk about um, some of these really um, nice measurements today. So um, Ben, um, thanks for talking and um, go ahead. All right, thank you so much. Um, I'm very excited to be speaking to you today. I feel very honored to uh, present at the Condensed Matter Seminar at Brown University. Thanks to uh, Kemp for the invitation. Um, the title of my talk is From Quantum Magnets to Magnetic Thermoelectrics, Short Range Spin Correlations and the Secrets They Keep. Um, maybe it's a little bit of an overly dramatic uh, title, you know, the secrets they keep and all that. Um, and I apologize for that. But, but actually, the title is wrong. It should be the secrets they tell. If you know how to look and, and how to listen, then the short range spin correlations that we see in, in interesting materials have a lot of secrets that they can tell us about the underlying physics of those materials. So we'll be spending some time today talking about that. Um, I'm first going to introduce the experimental technique called magnetic pair distribution function analysis, MPDF analysis, uh, which is uh, a way of looking at short range magnetic correlations um, from neutron scattering data. And then I'm going to show how we've applied this to look at two interesting systems. The first one is the triangular lattice antiferromagnet thulium uh, magnesium gallium oxide, TMGO. And I will show evidence for an intermediate costulate stylus phase in this material. Now, the, uh, I feel very intimidated coming to Brown University to talk about uh, the costulate stylus uh, phase transition. So I, I don't think Professor Costlitz is here in the audience. If he is, then I'll be even more <laughs> intimidated. But uh, anyway. Um, uh, uh, there's a, a lot of rich history, of course, and, and celebration at Brown University uh, on this topic. Um, and then time permitting, I'll switch gears and talk about um, a functional material, manganese telluride, a high performance thermoelectric, where short range magnetic correlations um, seem to be the, the origin of the, the um, promising thermoelectric properties of this material. So we'll look at the short range magnetic correlations and the high temperature limit of manganese telluride and what we can learn about that. So that's the outline. Um, I'd like to acknowledge uh, some of the many people who have been involved in, in these projects. Um, here at uh, Brigham Young University, um, I'm fortunate to have uh, graduate students Raju Baral and Parker Hamilton who have been involved in this work and also many excellent undergrad students working with me, um, Emma Zappala, Christiana Zaug and Jacob Christensen for their involvement. Uh, the TMGO collaboration is with Martin Morigal and his group at Georgia Tech. In particular, his former postdoc, Jiling Dunn, um, was, really helped to drive this work forward, as well as graduate student Marcus Down. We worked with Haidong Zhou at uh, University of Tennessee, Knoxville, um, for the samples. The manganese telluride collaboration is uh, with Raphael Hermann and Mike Manley at Oak Ridge National Lab, uh, as well as Julie Staunton on the theory side at University of Warwick. Uh, and the data that I'll show you were collected um, at a number of different facilities um, at the ILL instrument D4 in France. Henry Fisher was our collaborator there. And then a little closer to home, the uh, SNS Blation Neutron Source at Oak Ridge, the Corelli instrument with Feng Ye, and then the Nomad instrument, uh, Michelle Everett and Jua Liu helping us out there. Funding came from the Department of Energy. So, Part one, introduction to short range magnetic correlations and magnetic pair distribution function analysis. Um, 
So just to set the stage a little bit, uh, we are we spend a lot of time talking about long range order in materials. You know, the, the magnetic structure of a material. Um, usually we're referring to the, the long range pattern of, uh, of magnetic moments, for example, um, that, that are well-defined, have a well-defined correlation over very long separation distances. So this is what we're familiar with. We could, you know, even think of, of looking at, uh, you know, some arbitrary spin S naught and, and it's, uh, um, relate correlation with uh, some some other spin S i a distance r away in the limit of you know ideal long range order then uh, then this remains non zero even at infinite distances. But what I'm focusing on here is is short range order where if we look if we take you know a spin here at the center of our picture and and we look around it then there is certainly you know a net kind of anti ferromagnetic uh, correlation here but as we move further away then the correlation becomes more and more random less well defined so our our well defined short range correlations only exist over a finite distance maybe a few interatomic spacings all right and so the the limit of this spin correlation function is as the separation distance um, goes to infinity, uh, will be zero. There will be no long range order. Nevertheless, we'll have well-defined correlations on uh, short length scales. And typically the correlation function will die off exponentially uh, as a function of, of separation between the, the spins where C here would be our magnetic correlation length. So we're gonna be focusing on correlations of this nature right here. And these have, uh, shown up in a number of different contexts in condensed matter physics. In fact, we, we see these types of short range correlations um, uh, really uh, all over the place. Um, we see them in strongly correlated electron materials. Uh, very famously, we see them in geometrically frustrated magnets. We see them also in functional materials like dilute magnetic semiconductors or thermoelectrics as, I'll, as I hope to talk about uh, today if we have time. And, and many additional examples of of short range magnetic correlations being important for the physics and observed properties of a variety of different material systems. So how do you study short range magnetic order in materials? Um, naturally, we want, uh, neutron scattering provides a, a very powerful probe of magnetism in solid state uh, materials. And so, you know, you would think let's, let's do a neutron scattering experiment. And so you do that on a material with short range spin correlations, and you end up with um, beautiful diffuse scattering patterns like this. This is from a spin ice material um, where we, we do not have sharp Bragg peaks because there's no long range order, but we have this structured diffuse scattering here. Uh, makes for beautiful pictures, but can be challenging to analyze. Furthermore, if you aren't lucky enough to have a single crystal, then instead of a pattern like this, you might get something like this. Okay, this is from a, a the powder version of a spin ice, the the diffuse magnetic scattering you get in that case. And so you know we've got a few wiggles of intensity. Um, the question is, how do we make sense of this and learn about the short range correlations giving rise to this diffuse scattering? So one way to do that is using total scattering methods, specifically the pair distribution function method, um, which in general is sensitive both to the average and local structure because we are considering both the Bragg scattering as well as the diffuse scattering. And uh, you know, the way you do this experimentally is you, you take a sample, um, often a powder sample, but also you can use crystals with uh, 3D pair distribution function techniques are, are being uh, developed these days. Um, so you do a scattering experiment, you, you get your scattering data, um, and then you Fourier transform that out of momentum space and into real space. And the advantage of doing this is real space is an easier space to work in when you're thinking about local correlations, about the you know, spatial relationships between neighboring atoms or um, the, the uh, orientational correlations between neighboring magnetic moments. It can be easier to think about that in real space rather than momentum space. So by doing the Fourier transform, we obtain the pair distribution function, which we can then use for further analysis and modeling. And this has historically been done mostly 
looking at diffuse scattering from atoms and nuclei. So when you Fourier transform um, the scattering cross-section from, from atoms or nuclei for you know using x-rays or neutrons as the case may be, that yields the atomic PDF, okay? So uh, a, a real space map of the local atomic correlations. If instead you Fourier transform the diffuse scattering arising from the magnetic moments, that yields the magnetic PDF. And that's what we'll be focusing on mostly today. And it's a fairly intuitive uh, quantity. So I'm showing you here as an example, um, a one dimensional spin chain. If, if all the spins are aligned with each other, then we just get an array of positive peaks separated or uh, positioned at um, the separation between spins, which in this case I've chosen to be one angstrom for the, for the purpose of this illustration. Um, if on the other hand, we have anti-ferromagnetic correlations, then we have alternating negative and positive peaks, which kind of reflect that anti-ferromagnetic alternating arrangement of the magnetic moments. So at a glance, you can get a good idea of what the magnetic correlations are, right? Like the, the first neighbor peak here is negative because if you take any spin and look at its first nearest neighbor, it will have an opposite alignment uh, in, in the case of this 1D antiferromagnetic chain. So it's a nice intuitive function in real space that we can use to uh, visualize and understand short range magnetic correlations in materials. Um, so going back to this example of spin ice, um, which yields this diffuse scattering pattern, if we instead look at the real space magnetic PDF of a spin ice, then it looks like this. We have sharper, more well-defined features in real space where we can look at you know, specific peaks and relate those to specific distances between uh, pairs of spins and figure out information about the local magnetic correlations um, just by looking at the magnetic PDF in real space. So this is, this is the motivation and, and advantage of uh, using the magnetic pair distribution function to try to understand short range magnetic correlations. So let's see how this works in real materials. So first I'd like to talk about um, TMGO, all right, where uh, we, we have, um, found evidence for an intermediate costulate stylus phase in this material. Um, again, I feel embarrassed even sharing something like this at Brown University. Maybe a requirement of being at Brown is, is, to, is to study the work of uh, Professor Kostelitz. Uh, but uh, just, just to give a, a very brief review, um, the KT transition uh, is literally a Nobel Prize winning idea. Um, it's a topological phase transition that occurs in the two-dimensional XY model. And it corresponds to the binding and unbinding of vortex anti-vortex pairs. Okay, so this cartoon, which was generated, uh, I believe with the Nobel Prize announcement uh, five years ago now, um, shows how, what this could look like schematically. Um, so above the KT transition, we have isolated vortices kind of swirling around here, not paired up in any particular way, but below the transition, and we have a, a uh, tight binding of a vortex and an anti-vortex with opposite senses of rotation as shown here, all right? And so that transition um, is the costlitz thalus transition, which, which has been observed experimentally in um, a number of different systems now superfluid films, uh, arrays of Josephson junctions, uh, among others. It has not been observed as commonly in solid state magnetic systems. Um, and so there was, there's a lot of interest in knowing, can, can we observe this very famous transition in a, a solid state uh, dense spin system? And to give a spoiler, there is now mounting evidence for this type of KT transition in the geometrically frustrated magnet uh, TMGL. And, and the work that we've done has, has, uh, has helped to demonstrate that this is likely to be the case in this material. So let's talk about TMGO. Um, this is a really a, a model Ising anti-ferromagnetic triangular lattice system. So this is the crystal structure of TMGO. Um, we have these well-separated layers of thulium three plus ions that form a perfect triangular lattice. 
And the magnetic moments, the, the thulium uh, three plus magnetic moments um, are constrained to be Ising spins up or down along the C axis with antiferromagnetic exchange interactions. So this is the perfect scenario for looking at geometrical frustration in an Ising system. And uh, that's, you know, that's good and exciting, but what does this actually have to do with KT physics? After all, the KT transition is for a two-dimensional XY model, all right? So is TMGO really a good realization of a two-dimensional XY system? Well, it is two-dimensional, right? Because these thulium layers are, are well separated by these non-magnetic spacer layers here. And as far as we can tell, you know, to, to an excellent approximation, there is really no talking between these, two, these layers, uh, between subsequent layers of thulium spins. So it is a two-dimensional magnetic system. Is it an XY system? Well, not really. We just talked about how these are actually Ising spins, not XY spins, right? So what does this have to do with KT physics again? But there is an interesting mapping we can do to take these physical Ising spins and map them onto an XY system. And so let me briefly take you through that mapping. It's, it's a long and winding road to get there, and I won't go through all the details, but based on the crystal electric field and how that um, lifts the 13-fold degeneracy of the J equals six manifold, we end up with a two singlet ground state right here, where these two singlet states are separated by a very small amount of energy, about one Kelvin. Okay, so that's due to the crystal field. And so we have this you know, quasi doublet or more accurately, this two singlet ground state. And it turns out that this two singlet ground state can be mapped onto the transverse field Ising model. So if we have you know, a, a chain of Ising spins and apply a transverse magnetic field, the Hamiltonian looks like this, okay, uh, where, where we have this, the strength of the transverse field is determining our separation here. Um, and this is exactly equivalent to our two singlet ground state in TMGO, where now this energy separation between these two singlets um, is, is analogous to the strength of our transverse field. All right. So we can map this onto the transverse field Ising model. And the transverse field Ising model on a triangular lattice. Uh, triangular lattice results in um, three sublattice order. That's the ground state, where our triangular lattice spontaneously uh, can be divided up into three sublattices. Sublattice A with the red dots would be going to spin up. Sublattice B would be spin down, and then sublattice C, the gray dots, would be um, a superposition. And so this is a non-magnetic site. Okay, so so sublattice C is actually non-magnetic. All right, so this is the expected ground state for the transverse field Ising model with triangular geometry. And now here's where we're getting close to the XY model. We can actually take this three sublattice order and use it to uh, define an emergent complex order parameter psi. I'll sometimes call it a pseudo spin, although that's probably not a very accurate name for it. But we can define a value for this complex order parameter psi at the center of each triangle in our triangular lattice. So these black arrows represent this pseudo spin, this complex order parameter psi. And it has a real and an imaginary component. So it's two dimensional, two component. And so that's, our, that's where the xy comes in. All right. Now, in the case of this perfect three sublattice order, all of these pseudo spins end up pointing in the same direction, all right? Um, so we could think of this as a ferromagnetic arrangement of these pseudo spins. But if we allow defects or deviations from this perfect three sublattice order, then we can actually change the directions of these pseudo spins. And we can look for vortices and anti-vortices in the pseudo spins, not the physical Ising spins, but instead the pseudo spins. So down here in the lower left corner, again, black arrows are these pseudo spins, and then the circles represent the actual physical icing moments. This is kind of the ideal three sublattice order down here, 
But then in different parts of this figure, we have allowed some deviations from that uh, ideal three sublattice order. Um, and in particular, if we happen to have a triangle with three upspins or three downspins, then the pseudo spin takes a value of zero at the center of that triangle, but the surrounding pseudo spins can trace out a path with a net rotation. All right, so if we trace the red path here, as we follow it along, we are tracing it around in a counterclockwise direction, and the spins are also rotating. The pseudo spins are also rotating in a counterclockwise direction. So this is a vortex with positive vorticity. On the other hand, the blue path, if we rotate in a counterclockwise direction, the pseudo spins rotate in a clockwise direction. So this is negative vorticity. So we have a vortex and an anti-vortex bound together. Their paths are actually overlapping. So this is how we can get vortices and anti-vortices of x, y pseudo spins out of our actual physical Ising moments on a triangular lattice. Okay, so that concludes the long and winding road to how costlitz thalus physics could be relevant in this type of Ising triangular lattice system. So the theoretical prediction is there should be a costlitz thalus transition in this material because of this mapping. Now that the transition is, is you know, binding and unbinding of vortex pairs of the pseudo spins, all right? But the pseudo spins are simply a complex linear combination of the physical Ising spins, all right? Um, so that, that's just to, to keep our different spin systems straight here. Um, but here's the theoretical prediction. At high temperature, we're just in a paramagnetic phase. But as we lower the temperature, there is a phase transition into a costulitz thalus phase corresponding to the binding of these pseudo spin vortices and anti-vortices. And then as we lower the temperature further, we fall into the ideal three sublattice order ground state. But there's this intermediate phase that's predicted to exist, this intermediate costulitz thalus phase. And the transition temperatures were based on material parameters estimated to be around five Kelvin for this upper transition and one Kelvin for the lower transition. So that was the theoretical prediction. Naturally, we want to know if this is true or not. So the objective of our study was to use neutron scattering to determine whether there really is this KT phase, intermediate KT phase in TMGO. And again, spoiler, the short answer is that yes, we have, um, in my opinion, uh, pretty compelling evidence that uh, we do actually have this KT transition in, in this material. So as preliminary evidence, we can look just at magnetometry data. Look at AC magnetometry data in different fields shown here. We can look at the, um, at the differences between the signal depending on the field strength. And, and that's shown right here. This is the, the standard deviation between our six, uh, six different signals in different fields. And we see that there's an upturn in the deviation um, around four or five Kelvin. And then there's a much sharper upturn around one Kelvin. Okay, so we have a hint at least of two transitions happening, something happening here and something happening here. Okay, so that was encouraging enough at least to, to continue the study. So then we turn to neutron scattering. And first we did single crystal neutron diffraction um, at uh, the Corelli instrument. And here on the left, this is the diffraction pattern at 40 Kelvin in the paramagnetic state. Okay, so this is the high temperature pattern. Now at 0 0.4 Kelvin, this is the pattern that we get. And we see the appearance of additional Bragg peaks, okay, at one third, one third type positions. This is exactly what would be expected for this three sublattice order ground state, okay? So here at 0 0.4 Kelvin, we have ascertained the presence of this three sublattice order ground state, okay? But this is not the costlitz thalus phase. Remember the pseudo spins here, there is zero vorticity in this case. So this cannot be the costlitz thalus phase. So then the question is, what happens in this in an intermediate temperature where we expect the KT phase to be present? This is the scattering pattern at 2 Kelvin. Okay, so right here, where this intermediate phase is expected to, to, take, to occur. And we see that our relatively sharp 
peaks here have broadened out and become quite diffuse. All right, so we have this diffuse scattering. So that means we have short range magnetic correlations, predominantly of the three sublattice order type, right? The, these diffuse features are centered on these sharp peaks, um, but potentially somewhat more complex than that. Okay, so we have diffuse scattering, short range magnetic correlations. So this is what we want to dig into now. Ben, so, ben Kass, go ahead. question? Please. Um, it, so when you, it looks like um, the intensity scales are drastically different between the short range correlated and the long range correlated um, plots there. Um, so what, what would the long range correlated plot look like if you, if you actually um, saturated the intensity to the levels that it's saturated to in there? That's a great Which, question. Um, and I would need uh, Ji Ling, the postdoc who who was actually who actually collected and analyzed the data. He, I would need him to respond to that one. Um, but um, I think I, I think there's some type of uh, conservation law of, uh, that would be respected here. So I believe if you take all this and you concentrate it down into these sharp peaks, um, it will all be accounted for. Uh, you know, if if you really have measured all of the diffuse scattering correctly. But I, I wish I had a figure showing them on, on the same intensity scales. I don't have that. So, Thanks. Okay. All right. So to dig into this diffuse scattering and the short range magnetic correlations giving rise to this diffuse scattering, we actually took our single crystal and we did something which was very painful to the crystal growers. We ground it up into a powder and they were very generous to let us do that. And we actually took it to the ILL, took our powder sample to uh, the ILL in France, um, where we did a PDF experiment, a total scattering experiment. That could also have been done on Corelli, but when the data were collected here on Corelli, it wasn't done in a way that would allow um, any, any type of accurate uh, PDF uh, Fourier transform. So um, we did a, a separate experiment with a powder sample at the ILL. Um, Sadly, the cryostat there could only get us down to three Kelvin. So we have data from three Kelvin and above. Um, this is what the magnetic scattering cross-section looks like uh, after removing the nuclear scattering. Uh, so we see you know, very clear features here in the diffuse scattering. Um, as we raise the temperature, these features become smaller, uh, meaning that the short range correlations are, are giving way to thermal fluctuations. Um, so, but this is still in reciprocal space. So what we do now is we take these scattering patterns and Fourier transform them into real space. That's shown here on this figure from three Kelvin all the way up to four Kelvin. And now we can identify specific features in real space. For example, there's a very clear negative peak at the first nearest neighbor distance right here. Okay, so we have dominant anti-ferromagnetic correlations between first nearest neighbors. Interestingly, if we go all the way up to even 25 Kelvin, maybe even 40 Kelvin, there's still a little hint of this net antiferromagnetic correlation at the first nearest neighbor distance. Um, so that shows that this, you know, these are quite strong interactions giving rise to these short range correlations. All right, second nearest neighbor, we see a positive peak. So there's a net, posit net ferromagnetic correlation at the second nearest neighbor distance. If we go above 16 Kelvin, it's, it's really hard to say that anything is still there above the level of the noise. So it really seems like 16 or 10 Kelvin and below, that's, that's where we have these somewhat longer range correlations going out to higher neighbors than just the first nearest neighbor. Um, so you know, just inspecting the magnetic PDF patterns uh, already yields a lot of information, but we want to be quantitative about things. So focusing on 10 Kelvin and below now, we can try to fit the patterns using specific models of the short range correlations. So the first thing we tried was taking the ideal three sublattice order and just applying a, an exponential damping uh, envelope to it um, to represent short range correlations. And that's what the black dashed curve gives us, okay? The black dash curve is the three sublattice order with a finite correlation length applied to it. And it describes the data reasonably well. Now it gets these first couple of peaks quite well. But if we look 
carefully, you look at the third nearest neighbor and it misses it actually. It predicts a small negative peak. In the data, we actually see a small positive peak. All right, fourth nearest neighbor. Again, we, are, we can't quite capture the, the feature sufficiently at the fourth and fifth nearest neighbor. So the three sublattice order gets the, you know, the gross features of the data, but not the fine features. So that motivated us to try to improve the fits and, and learn more about the short range magnetic correlations using reverse Monte Carlo modeling, RMC modeling. RMC uh, is, is an algorithm where you, you, you have your um, model, your candidate model of the magnetic structure, which is just a big box of spins. You choose a spin at random and you flip it. And then you recalculate the magnetic PDF from this new configuration. And if that improves the fit, then you accept that spin flip. If it makes the fit worse, then you accept that spin flip only with a finite probability. All right. And that's designed to keep you out of local minima in your fit. So we ran the RMC algorithm together with, a, with this model of the three sublattice order, because as we know, the three sublattice order captures most of the features. So then we add the second component, this RMC component, to give us the fine features. All right. And we did 100 RMC refinements at each temperature point from 3 Kelvin up to 10 Kelvin. Um, and then we could look at these 100 different refinements and you know, ensure consistency and, and pull out statistics from them and so forth. And the result of that is the red curve here, all right, the solid red curve, um, which captures the feature at the third nearest neighbor and the fourth and the fifth nearest neighbors that our three sublattice order model could not capture. All right, so significant improvement to the fit, all right? So what can we learn from that? Well, we can then inspect the RMC configurations, you know, the output of this RMC algorithm when the fit has converged. We can look at what the, you know, what, what, what one of these optimized spin configurations is. And we noticed that vortices were naturally appearing. Okay, so the red and blue uh, spins represent the Ising moments, the actual physical Ising moments on the triangular lattice. And then from this configuration of red and blue spins, we calculated the pseudo spins, which are the black arrows. And then we searched for vortices and anti-vortices. And we found that they appeared naturally in the RMC output. So for example, here is an anti-vortex and here's a vortex bound together. Okay, here's another bound pair, vortex and anti-vortex. Here's an isolated vortex right here. So these naturally appeared in the RMC output. So that's intriguing, but this on its own doesn't prove anything because we are just randomly flipping spins. So of course, for, for any random spin configuration, you have the possibility of getting these vortices and anti-vortices. So this, this doesn't really prove anything yet. But what we can do is generate a whole bunch of completely random spin configurations. So we generated a thousand random spin configurations, and then ran our algorithm to identify vortex and anti-vortex pairs through these random configurations. And then we can figure out from that how many vortices and anti-vortices would we expect to appear just based solely on random chance. And then we can compare that to what we get from our actual RMC fits to the data. So here are the results. The blue bars here show the results from the completely random spin configurations. All right, so it's approximately a Gaussian distribution, which makes sense. Um, so, you know, we, we expect some vortices, vortex anti vortex pairs to show up even from random configurations. But then we look at how many actually showed up in the fits. Okay, this is the four Kelvin fit, this is the six Kelvin fit. Um, there is a strong preference for the RMC modeling to produce vortex anti-vortex pairs well beyond what would be expected from random chance. Okay. So to a, you know, to a with a P level of like, you know, 0 0.0001, we can say that the six Kelvin refinement is not due to random chance. Okay. 
that there is something else leading to vortex, anti-vortex pair formation. All right, here's another way to show the same thing. The shaded region here, this shows the average number of vortex, anti-vortex pairs, plus or minus one standard deviation. And we see that right around the expected upper transition into this KT phase, there is a, a clear excess of vortex, anti-vortex pairs being formed. As we cool further, and we're getting closer to the three sublattice order, then we start to lose those vortex anti vortex pairs because the three sublattice order is now dominating. But right here at this transition, in this transition region, we see a strong enhancement of the tendency to form vortex anti vortex pairs. So this is strong evidence from looking at the magnetic PDF data that there is a preference for the physical Ising spins to arrange themselves in such a way that the pseudo spins undergo a binding and unbinding transition. In other words, the pseudo spins undergo a KT transition um, around five Kelvin or so. So this is the this is not necessarily bulletproof evidence, but this is the, the strongest evidence that's been shown so far. And, and in my opinion, really quite strong evidence that um, this system does prefer to form these uh, bound pairs of vortices and anti-vortices um, in the intermediate KT phase. All right, so that's the, that, that's the first story of looking at uh, TMGO. And uh, again, to summarize, um, looking at the short range spin correlations in real space, right? Going back here, this is how we were able to identify um, specific features, you know, correlations at specific distances that could not be explained by the three sublattice model, but instead can be well described by uh, a model consistent with the formation of these vortex anti vortex pairs. So it was looking at the short range spin correlations in real space that revealed the secrets of TMGL. So that, that's the, the conclusion of, of this first example. Um, let me spend just a few minutes, nine minutes or so, looking at manganese telluride. This is now shifting gears uh, pretty drastically. Um, we're now can I, looking at- Can oh, I ask I, a question? Yes, please. Yeah. So in the previous uh, uh, material, mm -hmm. how large a magnetic field do you need to turn everything into uh, some sort of ferromagnetic ordering, uh, uh, turn them into parallel configuration? Um, it is- I think uh, I believe a little above five Tesla. Um, I, again, I need Geeling Dunn to bail me out here. Um, let's see if I actually have that. Um, yeah, no, I don't. I don't have the data with me, but uh, it's it's se uh, several Tesla to force it out of all of this uh, and and just into a, a you know saturated state. Okay. So, yeah. Thank you. All right. Can I? Sorry, can I ask um, something yeah. about so so I I think I think this is what you're saying, but um, it was the advantage of the M, uh, MPDF over just a diffuse scattering experiment, really that you could that there was a distinct experimental feature, just this this clear peak, because the analysis of a diffuse scattering experiment would also you would also probably use RMC um, in a similar way to to fit that data. That's right. So if we look here, you know, the reciprocal space data, and then here, the real space data, same information content, right? It's just, it's a Fourier transform. So it's the exact same information content. Um, and so, yes, you could do the same type of fits that we did, you know, the three sublattice order plus this RMC component. Um, and uh, I would expect you to arrive at the same answer because it's the same information content. There are some nice intuitive advantages to being able to look at it in real space though. So um, it's, it's uh, yeah, it's, it's same information displayed differently. And sometimes it might be easier to stick in reciprocal space, but I think in many cases, actually being in real space allows you to see things and understand things a little better. Uh, I'll ask you, I'll ask you another question. So yep. you use a neutron, right, to probe uh, the magnetic state. Imagine if you have a very sensitive uh, nanoscale magnetic sensor, 
mm -hmm. and you put very close to uh, to to the sample. Mm -hmm. do, you, do you think the, uh, the sensor will be able to hear this kind of mag uh, magnetic music? That's a great question. Um, I think so. I, I think you know if if you had the right tool and you know maybe uh, the 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 NV. Um, NV probe, maybe that's the way to go. I'm not. I'm not sure what the state of the art is on that, but I think so because you are. You know, this is one way to see how those Ising spins are arranged. If there's another way to see the same thing, then you should get consistent results, and that would be that would be a tremendous capability as well. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, then let me go on to manganese telluride just for a couple of minutes. It's a, it's a shorter story anyway. Um, manganese telluride is, is an old material, but recently some new ideas have been emerging from it. It has this very simple hexagonal structure, a very simple anti-ferromagnetic structure, um, you know, layers of ferromagnetically coupled spins and then alternating the magnetization along the C-axis. The nail temperature is 307 Kelvin, so this is in a, in a very different uh, realm of physics than the TMGO that we just looked at. Happens to be a semiconductor as well. Um, recently, it's garnered interest for two potential technological applications. One, as a platform for spintronics, using the antiferromagnetic domains to, to do interesting spintronics tricks. Um, and then secondly, as a high-performance thermoelectric candidate material. And I'll focus more on, on this one in the next couple of minutes. Um, the way you quantify how good a material is as a thermoelectric is through this figure of merit, ZT, which is uh, a combination of these properties, the Zabeck coefficient, the resistivity, and the thermal conductivity together with the temperature. And if ZT is approaching one or in excess of one, then you have a good thermoelectric material. But that's challenging because Typically, when you try to optimize one of these quantities, you're going to harm one of the others. So for example, uh, if, you, if you reduce the resistivity, then you're probably increasing the thermal conductivity, all right? So you don't get any net gain. So there's a challenge to optimize ZT, and there's a lot of creative people working on this. Um, in manganese telluride, it was noticed that with a, just a little bit of doping, ZT can be enhanced quite significantly, approaching one at high temperature. Uh, and so there was uh, you know, a lot of excitement about that and, and a lot of effort to understand why that is. And it appears that the secret for this high ZT in manganese telluride is a phenomenon called paramagnon drag. And it's related to the short range spin correlations in manganese telluride. So in the thermoelectric world, magnon drag is well known. This is a, there's a thermal flux of magnons that drags electrons through the material and enhances the thermoelectric response in that way. So paramagnon drag is similar, but it comes from paramagnons. So a paramagnon is just a magnon, but in a short range correlated paramagnetic state. Okay, so paramagnons are thermal fluctuations of the magnetization in, the short, in a short range ordered state as opposed to magnons, which are thermal excitations out of a long range ordered state. So the point is, if the short range magnetic correlations are, if they have sufficiently long length and time scales, then electrons won't know the difference between magnons and paramagnons. And so you'll get the same effect, all right? And in manganese telluride, inelastic neutron scattering work has shown that we have these magnetic excitations here in the paramagnetic state. So we, we have this kind of fluctuating uh, magnetization here. Um, and, and so uh, through, through some clever work by um, the Oak Ridge group, they were able to demonstrate that indeed for the length and time scales expected for, for these short range magnetic correlations, um, paramagnon drag should be a dominant contribution to ZT in manganese telluride. So that sets the stage. Um, it would be really nice to be able to probe those short range magnetic correlations directly, get some real space insight into these short range correlations that appear to be enhancing the uh, thermoelectric response. So that was the objective of, of our study, use magnetic PDF analysis 
to gain a real space picture of these short range magnetic correlations at high temperature in um, manganese telluride. So let me let me skip um, let me skip to the to the main results here. So this is showing the magnetic scattering at 330 Kelvin, okay, above the nail temperature. So kind of quasi Bragg peaks, all right, but certainly much broader than we have at low temperature, all right. And if we take now this is on, done on a single crystal. If we take the three-dimensional Fourier transform of our scattering pattern, then we get the three-dimensional magnetic pair distribution function. And I'm showing you here a slice of that three-dimensional magnetic PDF pattern. Um, and this, in this slice, we are looking at separation vectors um, in the XZ plane of the crystal structure, okay? And what we're seeing here, bright spots correspond to ferromagnetic alignment, so of spins separated by those vectors. Dark spots are anti-ferromagnetic alignment. So you can look at this, and at a glance, you can see the short-range magnetic relations. You can see that magnetic structure. As you move along the, the C-axis, you have alternating dark and bright spots from our alternating magnetic moments along the C-axis. Whereas if you just move along the X direction, then all the spots are of the same color because you have ferromagnetic alignment within the planes. All right, so that's already quite interesting. You can see the magnetic correlations directly in front of your eyes uh, through this 3D magnetic PDF uh, data. Um, if we look in plane, this is now X, Y, so we're in the A, B plane, and we see that we just have bright spots, again, because of that ferromagnetic alignment within the plane. All right, so this is, this is just really fun to be able to see these short range magnetic correlations in real space. But we can also be more quantitative about this. For example, we can take cuts of our data along the Z direction or along the X direction, and then see what the correlation length is along those different directions. And what we find is that along the C axis, the correlations uh, are much longer lived, have a much longer correlation length, than within the AB plane, right? So here, uh, our correlation length is 12.4 angstroms. Within the AB plane, it's, it's less than half that. So we have much longer range correlations out of plane than in plane, all right? Um, and that is an interesting and unique insight, which had not been, you know, which had not been uh, accessible through um, the earlier analysis that had been done on this material. Um, check the time here. So let me, let me just wrap things up. Um, we can also do one-dimensional magnetic PDF analysis on a powder sample of manganese telluride. Um, that's what I'm showing right here. Uh, this, now when, when you do a typical neutron scattering experiment without any type of polarization analysis, of course you get the nuclear and magnetic scattering cross sections uh, combined. And so by doing a joint modeling of the nuclear structure and the magnetic structure, we can um, come up with really good fits to the magnetic PDF data and then pull out, or sorry, really good fits to the total PDF data and then pull out just the magnetic component. So we see a, a very strong magnetic component at 100 Kelvin. Well, above the nail temperature, we also see a magnetic component. It is, it is weaker and it's only short range because the correlations are now no longer long range, but they're short range. But we can still do fits to the data and pull out information that way. Um, and we see, uh, yeah, we, we see also this tendency for an anisotropic correlation length uh, in manganese telluride, um, a longer correlation length out of plane than in plane. So it was interesting that we could also observe this even in a powder sample. Um, good, so just in the interest of time, um, I'll, I'll just mention briefly that uh, working with Julie Staunton and doing some very fancy DFT, um, in the dilute local, or sorry, the disordered local moment approach, um, we've been able to quantitatively reproduce the observed spin correlations that we extract from our magnetic PDF data uh, above 350 Kelvin or so. So this is nice. We have a solid theoretical framework for describing uh, the observed short range magnetic correlations in, in manganese telluride. And that anisotropy the fact that the correlations are longer ranged out of plane than in plane um, comes out naturally from the theory, which is also quite nice. 
Um, good. So let me let me skip this and and just uh, go to my conclusion slide here. Um, so I hope that I've demonstrated that short range magnetic correlations in materials have a lot of interesting information, a lot of secrets just waiting to tell us uh, about the underlying physics uh, and and, uh, and properties of interesting materials. Um, and there are uh, there are different ways to get at those secrets. Uh, held by short range magnetic correlations, but magnetic PDF is one way to do that. And I think a, a promising way to probe these short range magnetic correlations and get deeper insights into the physics of interesting magnetic materials uh, through real space analysis of magnetic PDF data. Thank you very much for your attention and I'm happy to answer any other questions there may be. Thanks, Ben, that was great. Um, so it's open for questions if anybody has them. I think, uh, Daniel, go ahead. Hi, hi Dr. Franzen. Um, nice talk. So I just had a clarification question on your first subject. Okay. Um, so the, you had that, that picture with the costerlitz thulis phase and there was like a T sub L and a T sub H for the low and high temperatures. Yeah. Um, and was the, so the high temperature was like four Kelvin approximately in that paper or something like that right and you so you showed that um the, the statistically uh you should see more of those um those bindings at six kelvin right in one of your other plots so that's is, right is this experimental um suggestion that that kt phase phase actually extends upwards into six kelvin and maybe even a little higher than that so i'm glad you noticed that there is a a detail, an important detail that I swept under the rug, which is the magnetic PDF data that we measured. And so this is the this is the diffuse scattering that we measured and then took the Fourier transform. This is without any energy analysis. So this is an energy integrated signal in a sense. So when we take the Fourier transform of that, we are probing the instantaneous spin correlations not the time average spin correlations. And so some of, in fact, of, yeah, some of what we see, and, and unfortunately we can't really quantify exactly how much, is coming from dynamic correlations. So, you know, at some instantaneous, at some moment in time, you take a snapshot, you'll see these correlations giving rise to, to these vortices and anti-vortices. Um, but uh, the magnetometry, data shown here, for example, is probing static correlations. So it makes sense that above the transition, we already start to see uh, these correlations building up because they'll be kind of dynamically fluctuating. And we're picking that up in our magnetic PDF data. Um, whereas the AC, pro, the AC magnetometry here is probing things on a slower time scale. So that's why we already start to see the signature. In fact, the strongest signature for us is around six Kelvin, uh, whereas the we, we start to see it turn on around four Kelvin in the magnetometry. So that's my that's my hunch for the discrepancy in the temperature there. It would be really nice to be able to do this experiment with energy analysis, and then we could take slices of, of energy transfer and figure out the static correlations versus the dynamically fluctuating correlations. Uh, that's a, a capability which uh, which I think is feasible or you know within the realm of possibility but hasn't been uh really well developed for magnetic pdf yet okay great thank you i i have one question actually related to this this last explanation i see this as a it says it's an ac susceptibility um mm -hmm. do they see any any frequency dependence to this uh high temperature transition um my recollection is not a strong frequency dependence. Um, this curve was; these curves were collected at, I believe, eighty hertz. If I'm if I'm remembering, um, uh, again, I I should have brought Jiling along with me. <laughs> um, my my best recollection is there was not a really strong uh, frequency dependence of note, um, uh, at least uh, in in the regime that that we explored or that Jiling explored with his measurements. Okay.
I was just wondering if it could also, uh, I mean, um, I, I think your explanation of the different um, temperature scales makes sense, but I'm wondering if, if uh, another thing that could be happening is potentially some glassy um, type um, physics annihilation. I think that's possible as well, yeah. If you if you do some uh, if you uh, try to replace thorium, is, is that thorium? Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, by by its neighboring elements, uh, and uh, you create some sort of a, a excess spin or deficiency of spin. Uh, what will be the effect on on the KP transition? That does it enhance it, or does it suppress it? It's a good question. To my knowledge, this has not been tried. Um, and so I, so I don't know what the expectation would be. Um, you know, things, things can change a lot depending on which rare earth you choose, right? You can have very different ground states. Um, but if you're just doing a kind of dilute substitution, I, I don't have a, a, a good, a clear idea of what we might expect in that case. Um, that's something that I should bring up with uh, the crystal growers and see if that's, if that's feasible, if that's something uh, that we could look into. But Unfortunately, I don't have a good ex uh, expectation at the moment for, for what we might see. Yeah, go ahead, Sean. Um, what happens uh, uh, to this uh, um, uh, vortex uh, configuration if there's a, uh, one atom is missing? So if if we are missing an atom here on the original triangular lattice, is that what you mean? Yes. Mm -hmm. Well, in a sense, our complex order parameter can't be well-defined anymore, right? Because you require the A, B, and C sublattices, all three sublattices uh, to be present. I suppose you could just, you know, turn this just, uh, just remove it. And, and in a sense, that's what happens for, for the gray sublattice. This is the spin zero sublattice. So it's, it's as if it's missing in a sense. Um, but if you, you know, if you are disrupting that three sublattice uh, partition of your triangular lattice, then I think this becomes less well-defined. Um, so my feeling is it would, it would disrupt the tendency toward a KT transition. That would be my feeling. Can it be viewed as a local magnetic field? Maybe so. Um, that that's an interesting way to think of it. I'd have to think some more about how that would, yeah, how that would actually play out. Um, that's something. That's an interesting thing to think about. So you, you've given me some homework now to mm -hmm. think about that some more. That's uh, Sean. I guess that's similar to how um, Bob Rishno did the random field Ising model, right? With a uniform field, but in a, in a disordered magnetic system. Yeah, but that's a, that's viewed as a transverse field, right? Well, this is a transverse field Ising model. That's right. the The crystal mm -hmm. field levels are map onto a transverse field Ising model. Okay. So this might be able to be viewed as a random transverse field. If so, in fact, I'm curious if you dope the material with some some uh, impure uh, some dopants, you could create a, such a, a situation intentionally, right? Yeah, I think I think there is some interesting stuff to explore here, and uh, you know this is. This is very much still a material of interest that, that people are looking into. So um, I, I think all of these things are interesting avenues to explore. So this is, a, yeah. this is a general mapping when you, when you have a transverse field Ising model on a triangular lattice, mm -hmm. um, you expect this kind of mapping to apply? Yes. That's right. Okay. There, this, this is uh, kind of general. I'm, I'm just thinking through. There's, there was nothing kind of system specific. Um, 
so yeah i mean if you've if you've got your crystal fields set up the right way um then this should be a general mapping mm -hmm. yeah Okay, I guess I have it, uh, um, I mean, over time, but I have a kind of a general question. I mean, um, it's, it's, it's nice how, um, I guess, this discrepancies between um, some sensible model and the data is kind of glaring in the magnetic PDF, which allows you to then dig in a little bit deeper. Mm -hmm. um, so diffuse, diffuse scattering is something that people have been measuring in um, frustrated magnets um, for a very, very long time. Right. Um, but they haven't looked at it in this sort of way. Do you think, so do you think um, there's lots to be found if we would go back and look at some, um, some systems that we maybe even perhaps thought we understood um, very well? Yeah, or... I, I, I mean, I think, I think, yes, there are likely to be surprises uh, hiding there um, if we were to go back and, and look at it from a, from a real space point of view rather than yeah. from super real space. Um, you, you know, if you think of, if you think of like the famous example of a spin ice, you know, there's, it's not just the diffuse scattering, right? There, there are so, uh, other signatures as well. And so, you know, you, you uh, build up confidence in those results. Um, but I, I would be very interested in, in going back and looking at some kind of classic diffuse scattering um, material, materials that have these kind of classic uh, diffuse scattering patterns and just take a look and see, is it exactly the same? Do we get the same answer uh, if, we, if we take a real space view or is there something, something new uh, or, or uh, something still to be clarified? Um, so that, in my mind, that would be a very worthwhile thing to do. Um, in, in a funder's mind, you know, it's another question maybe, <laughs> but the, the mind of the funding agencies, um, mm -hmm. but, yeah, I mean, the thing is, like if you if you're looking at in reciprocal space, and you notice that your model is missing something, you know, is is getting the general pattern, but but maybe misses it. Uh, there, there's some kind of systematic uh, thing that you're missing, or you know, you you see some wiggles in the in the fit residual. Um, it's hard to have a clear physical picture of what's going wrong in the model, right? Mm -hmm. But then in real space, you can identify, you know, oh, okay, it's at the first or the second or the third nearest neighbor where there's some something wrong with the model, right? So in, in a sense, it's, you can guide your thinking more easily um, by looking at things in real space. That, that's my feeling, at least. On the other hand, people who live their lives in reciprocal space probably have built up the same level, level of intuition and, and can maybe do it just as well. In reciprocal space, but uh, for me at least, real space provides a nice intuitive space to look at things and think about things and and guide guide your thinking as you're trying to understand the data. Mm -hmm. That seems so. Mm -hmm. I do wonder though if that's the case. I mean, you showed very nice examples of basically collinear. I mean, spin ice was not one, but basically collinear antiferromagnets. But if you have um, non-collinear structures, spiral mm -hmm. structures, uh, mm -hmm. real space correlations then also will just look like, um, well, I guess it's still discrete. It's on a lattice. So, but I think it would maybe also be confusing. <laughs> yeah, but, but you're right. If you take the example of like a skirmion, for example, mm -hmm. um, if you look at local, like nearest neighbor type correlations, they look pretty boring, right? Yeah, because exactly. the modulation yeah. is is over a much longer length scale. And yeah. so then you you have to look, you know, you're looking in reciprocal space and, and you see a, a satellite peak, you know, with a, a small separation from, from the main Bragg peak. And, and that's clearly an example where reciprocal space will serve you better. So there are definitely, you know, situations where one or the other may be, um, yeah more naturally to your advantage than the other. Yeah. Um, and then so you also, I mean, um, you, you preempted my question um, in your answer to Daniel's question, um, but I wonder if you can say a little bit more about feasibility of actually looking at, so um, 
real space inelastic scattering or kind of looking yeah. at the um, or maybe just purely maybe just purely infinite time correlations or kind of time resolved right correlations so, do you think that's a do you think that's really a possibility or are you trying I do to I do that? think it's a possibility and in fact it's being developed so dynamic pdf is what it's typically called yeah um takeshi egami has been doing a lot on this um not looking at magnetism though looking at yeah. structural correlations but doing experiments on arcs i think arcs is the instrument where it's been demonstrated um to mm -hmm. Uh, to, to maximum effect so far. So, you know, you're doing a time of flight inelastic scattering experiment. Um, and then, um, you know, if you have sufficient Q coverage and that can be a problem because you are limited in your Q coverage, but, you know, depending on the energy slice and everything, like if, if you have sufficient Q coverage, then you can just, you can take slices of your data and do the Fourier transform. Um, and, or you can, Fourier transform in, in time and space and get the Van Hove function. Um, and so then you're looking at things like as a function of time delay, mm -hmm. how is this atom correlated to that atom? Or how, how is you know, this magnetic moment correlated to that magnetic mo moment? Um, so there have been some, um, some experiments done successfully on this. Um, it's a, definitely a challenge, but it's something that I think is feasible. And as far as doing this with magnetic scattering, um, I don't see any fundamental limitation uh, beyond, you know, beyond the normal difficulties of a weak signal and, you know, the form factor and all that. Um, but it's, I think it is within the realm of feasibility. Um, and it, yeah, something that I'm kind of thinking about and, uh, you know, maybe high spec would be an interesting in instrument to try to use to do an experiment like that with magnetism. So um, a challenge, but not completely out of the question. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Seems quite neat. Yeah, I'm, I'm excited to see where that goes in the future and, you know, hoping to play a part in that as well. We'll see. Yeah, so you think the, I mean, this is now we're getting into now neutron scatters talking, but do so you think the the instrumentation is, is there for that, or do you think there needs to be some um, specific developments? Like, I, I don't know if, if TS2 is really the place where those sorts of developments yeah. would happen, right? Yeah, I don't it seems see. like more like a, yeah. Right. I, I don't see TS2 as, you know, necessarily opening the door for this type of analysis. Honestly, yeah. I think... I think we already have um, what we need to do, you know, to get started on this at least. Mm -hmm. uh, I think I think arcs um, can do it. Uh, and in fact, um, even in the early days of arcs, people took just the elastic channel and did regular PDF on that, right? And and show that they could do that successfully. So. Um, the Q range is there and the, you know, for magnetic scattering Q range isn't going to be as crucial anyway um, because of the form factor. Uh, so I think it's there. I think it's um, just a matter of learning how to deal with the data and you know, you know, minimize uh, confounding signals and all that. So um, I have a lot of optimism for it actually. Uh, and and you know, I'm, I'm hoping to move in that direction. Cool. Yeah. Okay. So um, some people are still here. I don't know if there are still questions for Ben. If you want to talk to him. Um, I'm going to turn off the, I probably should have done this a second ago. I can turn off the recording. All right. Mm -hmm.